Let's talk first off the news of the day of China, 5% growth target. Let's say that happens. What's going to be the commodity pull on that, the natural gas and the oil demand pull? Well, I think as you look at China, really the big item that's changed is the aspects of post-pandemic. And as you look at the energy demand and also the desire for energy, it's increasing and it's going back to the historical highs, which means you're going to see more being consumed in China. A 5% GDP growth also means there's going to be more consumption. And also you look at natural gas and LNG. China during the course of last year actually reduced some of the LNG mm -hmm. cargoes. They went to Europe. We see that going back to China now. So overall, China is very constructive from an energy demand perspective this year. So from that, are we going to see China compete with Europe for those LNG cargoes? Or is there going to be enough to go around just all at higher prices? Well, luckily, we are seeing more capacity that's coming on stream. Mm -hmm. And we've got a number of projects. You know, if I said last year, during the course of two years, we'd have 100 to 150 million tons of FIDs. We are seeing that. We're on track for that. And as we look at 2030, there's still going to be a need for an installed capacity of 800 million tons. So, uh, yes, there will be some competing going on for LNG cargoes. But we think over time that will actually balance out and LNG is actually going very positive. And FID final investment decision, which is when you're actually able to get the projects done. We'll get to that in just one, one moment. So on that, if all of a sudden someone said, Lorenzo, I need this much LNG capacity, can you deliver it? Or does it need to be at just a higher price? Like, do you have the stuff to deliver or do you just have to charge more to do it? So we have the stuff to deliver. Okay. And again, LNG is not just any one type. There's different models which can be actually a stick build, a modular build. And what we're seeing a big theme on right now is actually modular builds. And we've got mm. our sites in Italy that have become very much uh, module experts. And so we've been able to deliver uh, modules that allow from FID to first cargo with 26 months. Which and basically you build it there, you kind of move it, you ship it, you plop it down, and you correct. use it. Yeah. So, it, it, so talk about the inflationary part of that, though. Um, how much are you going to charge for your services? You're in a lot of different kind of businesses. How sticky are these prices? Well, we're seeing a constructive pricing environment. And okay. obviously, when there's a demand for the equipment and the services, it makes the outlook constructive. Again, we are competitive and we play in a competitive landscape. So, you know, our purpose is to be there and partner with our customers and make sure that these projects go forward. So SLB was telling me earlier today that they're seeing double-digit price increases, mostly offshore, but that's one part of it. And then uh, I was talking to Scott Sheffield of Pioneer. He's like, I'm not paying double digits. Nah, -uh, I'm just going to shut down my rigs. Wh who went? What, what do you see? You know, I think, uh, again, from our standpoint, uh, we've got very strong customer relationships. It's also a competitive landscape. And the pricing environment is constructive. I, I can't for speak you or to, for the producer? <laughs> actually, overall right now, it's constructive because also the producers have had uh, elevated commodity prices as well. So I think um, we've got to look how things go forward. At the end of the day, we're here to provide the energy that the world needs, and that means we've got to go forward. That seems like that's higher prices. Double digits? Single digit? Price increases for you guys? We are taking a, a pricing increases given the inflation we've also experienced, and so the pricing environment is constructive at this time. Okay, you're not going to tell me how many digits, are you? We have so many different products and services, it would be uh, incorrect. So, okay, so let's take it a different way. You're talking about final investment decisions. Um, they think the world was expecting a lot more to come online and a lot more projects to get approved. When does that like gush of cash come in? And like, when does Baker Hughes get to book it? Well, if you look at uh, our orders in uh, 2022, we had record order intake. And in fact, a lot of that was driven by LNG. And we're actually producing a number of the uh, modules and liquefaction trains mm -hmm. that are necessary. So I hear what you're saying, that it seems like it's slower. In fact, when we look at the outlook, we're on track for the 100 to 150 million tons. And we see this as being a multi-year cycle of positive growth in LNG. Who's spending? Is it uh, the big oil integrators? Is it the NOCs, the national oil companies? It's smaller EMPs? What kind of company is spending? From an LNG perspective, yeah. it really covers the board. You've got the US uh, independents. Uh, you've got a number of projects that uh, you look at what Chenier's done. You look at um, also what's going forward with some of the Port Arthur mm -hmm. and uh, ConocoPhillips and Sempra. 
again, a number of these um, companies are moving forward. Also internationally, you look at what Qatar's doing, uh, you look at what uh, Total is doing in Mozambique. So we are seeing an increasing interest globally around LNG. What about oil? Oil, again, we've seen an uptick in activity. And again, internationally more so. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the NOCs, again, they've got their capital budgets that they've allocated. And we do see a hunger and a need for more oil as well as the demand is there. And the underinvestment that took place previously. Are these like big mega projects? Are these deep water? Are they exploration projects? What are you seeing? So deep water uh, hasn't come back to the same levels it was pre. However, it is improving, but we're seeing a lot of onshore activity and also shallow offshore. Uh, you look at what uh, Aramco, for example, Adnoc have announced as their capital expenditures. There's significant growth year over year that they're targeting. So are we going to see the return of like the IOCs, the NOCs, the EMPs all working together and JVs and these enormous projects, or is that era done? I think there'll be some large okay. projects, but I think there's still a lot that we can do from a brownfield perspective and not have to go to the large greenfield. Also, new technologies that enable us to get a better recovery rate. So uh, if you look at digital applications, yes. uh, we just recently uh, launched Lucipa, which is an integrated operation for well sites, and we've got a customer in Argentina, and that's helping to drive productivity. Likewise, with our industrial and energy customers, this morning we announced with BP the rollout of a digital platform, which again is going to help them drive optimization, Cordant. Well, to that point, how quickly can the digital services and that part of your business make up more and more of your revenue? It's really an adjacency to the equipment that we provide. So it will always be an adjacency that yeah. helps to drive productivity, good margin rates, and really helping the customer drive efficiencies. But at the core, you still need the big equipment as well. So let's just touch on North America for a moment. Um, with ENPs, you were saying that you're gonna, they're going to grow about zero to five percent, and you have said that the oil fill services in North America is just kind of flat. What do, what do you think would change that? Is it an oil price? What is it? So there's a couple of factors. Yes, oil prices definitely drive an increase, but a lot of our customers are also being very disciplined from a capital perspective. So I think there's the aspect of supply and demand that's leveling off mm -hmm. here in North America, and that's what you're seeing in North America. Internationally, still a different story relative to the demand outstripping the supply. In internationally, what changes that bullish story? Because that's a really good long-term visibility that you have with that. What changes it? Well, we're always looking at uh, the economic situation, the uh, risk of a recession. What we have to remember, though, this is a long cycle industry, and we've had several years of underinvestment. The pandemic was obviously an impact. Also, the conflict you see between Russia and Ukraine. And so we think we're in a multi-year upswing of demand coming back and also us needing to supply. How much of that do you think is going to be changed by the IRA or any kind of new stuff that's coming out of Europe in terms of financing? Like, does that, is, it, is your bullish view encapsulate that? It does, and I think actually what it's going to do is drive a lot more investment in the energy transition. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the energy mix shifting to lower carbon footprint, not focusing on the fuel source, but focusing on the emissions, we've seen a huge increase in interest in hydrogen, CCUS, the opportunity to also in Europe, with Repower Europe, go to new energy mixes. So we see it as actually incremental growth for a company like Baker Hughes that has the technology across all of the different elements of the energy mix. So last year, it was a really, it was a big restructuring year for Baker, right? Uh, getting back on track, working on your margins now. What's gonna be the theme for you guys this year? What's like the number one thing that Lorenzo's going home every night and saying like, I gotta do this? So we've said this, we're going to operate with excellence. We created our two business segments, yeah. oil field services and equipment, industrial and energy technology. We announced that there's going to be efficiency in our cost structure and annualize 150 million. We were going to improve our free cash flow generation. Again, we like our balance sheet. So it's really all about execution. Execution, and do you feel, what's your level of confidence in your execution? Scale from one to 10, 10 being amazing. You know, I have a great team, and I think we manage what we control, and we can make it happen. Does anything throw you off that? There's like a low oil price, low natural gas prices. Like, what throws you off on that? We're always going to see uncertainties economically. 
but at this time, a lot of it is in our control mm -hmm. and we got to stay focused on our execution and that's what the team's doing.